Psalms 119, and we're going to start in verse 88. 88, Psalms 119, quicken me according to thy loving kindness, so shall I keep the testimony of thy mouth. Forever, O Lord, thy word is, a, is settled in heaven, and thy faithfulness is unto all generations. Thou hast established the earth, and it abides. They continue this day according to your ordinances, for all are your servants. Now, uh, there's just really a particular part here in verse 89 that I've focused on in the notes and just in my thinking about this lesson. Uh, all of it fits together, of course. But what we're going to talk about tonight is really... If you remember our last class, what we're going to talk about tonight is really the uh, observing of the real foundation of that. Why can we say, why can the psalmist here say in our previous, previous verses, your law, your commandments are faithful? Uh, and as we said, it's not just faithful, it's your law is faithfulness. It is God's faithfulness in an overwhelming and a comprehensive testimony. And the reason he can say that is because the law had and his testimony has continually an everlasting and eternally sure and settled object that lies as its basis for even existing. Okay. That, Everything we read, the testimony itself, the word of God, and you have to understand, we've said this before in the classes, that when he uses the word statutes, commandments, word, law in Psalms 119, he uses them all interchangeably. So he's talking about the law. He's talking about the scripture, the testimony. And the reason he can say it is faithfulness or it is faithful is because of what 89, verse 89 says, forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Now, that is why you're going to see, because you see, you know, he established the earth, his faithfulness to all generations, he established the earth and it abides. We'll see that terminology used. It's a descriptor, descriptor of the stability of, uh, where we're going to go in Jeremiah later, the stability of the mountains and the certainty of the stars staying in place and the sun itself staying in its place. You will see this is used as a, a, a way, the terminology that's utilized by the prophets to describe God's faithfulness to his people. And basically you're seeing the same thing here, but it all hinges upon this very thing, your word is settled. Listen to that, because this is going to be important as we go. It's settled in heaven. And a part of that, and reason that we can say that his law is faithfulness based upon this eternal settlement in heaven, eternally, before there was ever a thing done or a creation created. God's thought, his word, his intent, which is what that word term, word, means here was already settled, it was already established, and it will not be moved, and it cannot change. So to look at that, well, we could say it this way. There was never a moment that the word of God or the testimony or the dictates and requirements of the commandments there was never a moment where those things rested upon the frailty of man's deeds or his actions for their fulfillment. Never. Why? Because that testimony, that word, those commandments, those statutes were already settled in heaven, fixed 
upon and in one particular singular object. Now, as I was reading that and that just thinking about those things, the first verse that came to my mind, of course, was Romans 7, verse 14. Paul says it this way. We know that the law is a spiritual thing. I am unspiritual. The slave bought and sold of sin. That's from the Weymouth translation. I like that translation because look at the way he says it. I am a, I am, I am unspiritual. I hope we can hear that. I am unspiritual. The slave bought and sold of sin, meaning sin bought in. I mean, it was my, it controlled me. It was my tyrannical master. That's me. But the law, now this is me unregenerate. This is me not in Christ because that's what Romans 7 is talking about. And we're going to read that in a moment. But, but look at the law, how he describes the law. The law is spiritual. In juxtaposition, in the difference between me and the law, the law is spiritual. I am carnal. I am unspiritual. So we, I think it's good for us to just take this moment to truly appreciate the distinction being made here. This distinction is important. This perfectly speaks of the eternal nature and the heavenly assurance of the law, the word, the testimony. Now, I don't mean that the faithfulness of God's law is seen in the distinction between the spirit and the flesh or, or, or you know, Christ and us. That's not what I'm saying. The faithfulness is not found there. I do mean that the faithfulness of God's commandments and the testimony is in that the law of God had full intention and rested upon that which is spirit alone and nothing else. See, what I mean by that is it stood and it stands surely on the perfections of the man of spirit in origin and in accomplishment. And there was never a moment that it rested or had expectation upon the imperfections of the man of flesh. Me and you. Why? Because it was already settled before me and you. Ooh. It was settled in heaven before. This is even the same thing said in, in, in Galatians when he says that this covenant was confirmed or ratified in Christ before that the law that came could not disannul it or nullify it because it was settled. Well, what he's saying is your word, your testimony, which carries with it, and we'll read the definition in a moment, his full intent, everything that he had as a thought, as a will, as a purpose and intention, was already fixed and settled upon one thing before anything else was. See, that should give us assurance in our salvation because that's who's in us. So let me try to explain this a little more. The faithfulness of the commandments, the testimony, is that the law of God was fully fixed and settled upon that which is spirit and not that which is flesh. It was settled upon him and not us. Okay? It stood on the perfection of Christ and not our imperfections. Mm -hmm. And that is why outside of Christ, under the law, Man could never glory in those distinctions as long as Christ was yet apart from the soul, meaning flesh and spirit. That was torment to the soul because look at Paul in seven. That distinction was, I can never reach this. 
man in himself under the law of sin and death, he could never glory in the distinction between flesh and spirit because he could never say, or, or he would always have to understand, that's a goal I cannot reach. That's an end I cannot arrive at. But in Christ, that soul can now boast in the unending joy that these vessels are filled with an imputed life and a righteousness of another who is the spiritual answer to the spiritual law. Oh, that's good. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Then we we oh. can now rest in that reality. Mm hmm that in our souls dwells the spiritual answer and amen to a spiritual law. That does that. What that means is no demand is on you or me. What was demanded is in you and me. Oh, that is oh. Romans eight. Oh, the wow. law, wow. Wow. the righteousness of the law fulfilled in us. So, oh. I was I, I pulled this up from Jameson Fawcett and Brown uh, commentary, and he says that the apostle's meaning here is perfectly plain. First, by the opposition of carnal to spiritual, the law being spiritual demands. Listen to this: demands spiritual obedience. But that is just what I cannot, being carnal, do. You see the impossibility here. That is why the beauty of the law and the faithfulness of the law is that it was already settled in heaven in view of another man and not me. Already. Predetermined, pre-established, pre-settled. The law being spiritual demands spiritual obedience. Now, that's exactly what we can't give. We can't yield that as a man under the sin and death. That's, And even now in Christ, it's not us yielding that. That's the thing we need to grasp. We who are in Christ are not now made capable of yielding spiritual obedience. Listen to those two words, spiritual obedience. Go back to Romans 5. We're constituted righteous through what? The obedience of one man. There's the spiritual obedience that the law being spiritual demanded. Now, this obedience, we water this down and we make it a just nothing. When we talk about, let's be obedient to God. And what does that mean? Oh, I don't know. Let's feed a few people poor people. That's not spiritual obedience. That's not even good works. If you want to get down to it, that's just, okay, let's feed some people. We have narrowed, we have brought this down so low. It means nothing. The obedience to Christ was not uh, mere obedience as we defined it in Christianity. It's not the fact that Jesus came and just did what God said. It was that Jesus came as the man that God was expecting, the man who fulfills his purpose. Lo, I come. In the volume of the book, it was written to me. See, that should give a clearer, greater appreciation of those verses. He came as the one God expected, not just, I'm going to do whatever God says. I'm obedient. No, I am the one God was after. And this didn't catch called God off guard because the law and the commandments, the whole of the scripture was already established as far as their ultimate intent and goal. And it was that man all along. Again, just what Jesus says in the volume of the book is written of me to do thy will, O God. 
as he says to the Pharisees who thought that their obedience was what was going to give them eternal life because they were going to take the law, utilize what it says, implement it, and do it perfectly, and they thought they had eternal life. And he says, hey, they are they that testify of me. It's my obedience that it's talking about, not yours. It's my perfection that it's demanding, not yours. Because it was settled in me before you existed. No Pharisee executing man's level of obedience to the law could ever bring about the result that Christ as life does. I want that to sink in because that was the whole point. Come to me that you may have life. Not come to me and I'll make you do this perfectly. Not come to me and I'm going to help you do this better. No, come to me and you'll have the life in which perfect obedience resides, perfect righteousness resides. And here's... um. Just to recontext, well, this is one of the only commentaries. This is Adam Clark's that that would actually say, because most of them want to take Romans 7 and they want to make it a Christian having bad times trying to live holy. So a Christian's really falling and having problems and gets back up, brushes himself off, and then tries it again, fails, and like, oh, what am I doing wrong every time I try to do good? No, this is a man under the law of Moses and governed by the law of sin and death. Why? Because the law of Moses had what? A pre-settled and fixed conclusion. And it was not Paul. That's why Paul couldn't fulfill it. That's why nothing Paul did as perfectly as he did what he did could never fulfill it because God designed it that way. Because he had settled it already in one. He had established it perfectly in one man. Its conclusion was predetermined. The conclusion is not determined by how good we are and how well we do. The conclusion was determined before we existed. And when we are born again, we are, our soul is that becomes the habitation of that predetermined, pre-settled conclusion of God. What does that mean? That means that everything my soul needed and was created for, it now possesses, and it needs nothing else. That means that my soul is in perfect harmony with the purpose and will of God, because it is now the habitation of the one that God himself chose before the foundation of the world. The one that God settled his full attention and fixed his gaze upon before there was ever a man to do so. I want, I want us to see that the world needs, the church world needs to understand this. That's why the law was the faithfulness of God in a testimony, because the law was a testimony of the one in whom it was forever settled in heaven eternally. And when we are born and that one comes to dwell in our hearts, then our soul becomes the place of God's settled issue. Everything's settled. Everything's established. Everything's good. It's as he says over his creation when he finished it finally and said, it is very good. That's who's in us. Because he did that, we'll read, he did that upon the basis of something pre-established and settled. So uh, anyway, I'm not going to read that commentary, but that's what he talks about is how it was a man under the law. Um, in Romans 7 and not a Christian trying to uh, live for God, having troubles. From the Kiel and Delich commentary, he says, it, the word, 
what we're reading in, in Psalms 119, the word has heaven as its standing place. And therefore it also has the qualities of heaven. And before all others, heaven like stability. I like that phrase, heaven like stability. That's what most people are missing as far as their understanding of salvation is a heaven like stability. Why? Because our stability rests upon the earth and not the things of the heaven. Our stability is always on the shaky ground and the variations of men when God's has always been on the certainty of his son. Fixed there forever. To see further what it says in that, uh, in Psalms 119.89, we go here to John chapter 1, of course. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him, outside of him, nothing, not anything was made that was made. Here in the Greek, it's the word logos or logos uh, that is used. The word logos actually means revelation, um, speech. In some commentaries, they use it as the word definition. In the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, it says the clarification or the explanation of something. It is the content of a thing in terms of its meaning, its basis, and its structure. Now, I want you to understand that in the light of what he says, forever thy law was established in heaven. Forever your law is established in heaven. Logos... Now, we're going to get into the nuances of the word, but logos means the, the full clarified explanation of something. It is the content, listen to the word, the content of a thing in terms of its meaning, its basis, and its structure. So when we speak of the word who was in, in the beginning, in the beginning was the word we're talking about before anything was in the beginning, there was the content and meaning and the basis of everything that God would do and would say, and every action of God standing with God as God was his full, clear explanation of himself. He didn't look for anything after his creation to try to find the full explanation of his purpose. He had it already. He was it already. So refer back to just back to Psalms 119.89, the word in the Hebrew that says your word is established forever or is settled forever, same word. It's it's the word uh, Dalbal, which is 1697. It's in the uh, Strong's, that number. You can look it up. And it, it's, a I mean, it has so many meanings, but it, it kind of encompasses everything. It means the answer, the cause, the commandment, the judgment, the speech, the thought, and it has word and work in it as well. Not just the word, but the very work. So just look at all of that and see that in that word where he says, your word is established forever in heaven. He's talking about God's thought, his intention, his word, his work, his judgment, his will. And it was already established, settled forever in heaven before there was ever a man created. And this is exactly what John is saying, that this word 
was in the beginning with God as his full and clear explanation of his purpose and thought and plan and intention, meaning God did not have to look beyond himself in eternity to find anything that fulfills his desire because he already had it and was it. That's good news for us. Amen. And then it goes on in verse 14 of John 1 and says, and the word here, this same word, who embodies everything of God's purpose and intent, was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me was preferred before me. You hear that? Why? Because he's the one upon whom God was settled. Mm. He was preferred before me, for he was before me, and of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And no man, listen to this verse, this is beautiful, and no man hath seen God at any time. But the only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Mm. Now, this is going to be important as we get to the end of the lesson, but he has declared him. Listen to this. This is the Word who was made flesh, who came as grace and truth in, in fulfillment of the law that was given by Moses. He came as the fulfillment. That's the grace and the truth part. The law was given by Moses demanding, testify, prophesy. Jesus came as grace and truth so that the realities that Moses spoke of could finally, by grace, be the possession of those who would believe upon him. And in that eternal one who was made flesh and dwelt among us, God himself was declared fully. That word hath declared him is actually in the Greek. It's where we get the word exegesis from, where we get the word exegesis means a full, utter explanation. The full explanation, with nothing left out, fully explained, made known clearly. That's who the Son is. He came as that. <coughs> now, the word who was in the beginning, the divine son, the person, the substance of spirit, it was before anything was made. He stood as the reasoning, the thought, and the explanation of God himself. It is the word himself who comes as the full explanation of God's thought, his intention, his purpose, his aim. Now John states that the law... It was given as a testimony. Christ came so that that which was testified of could finally become the reality of those who believe. Now, Jesus' full explanation of God himself was not that he merely spoke words about him or declared anything about God. It was that the word was fully embodied in his being. He was the word. He was God's thought, his intent. So you have to understand this, this, the word made flesh is that he came as the full embodiment of God's aim, purpose, and conclusion. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you this. <laughs> That is why we started this Psalms 119, I guess it comes into play where he says, I am. It came as the I am. The beginning, the end, the first, the last. I am the truth. I am the life. <clears throat> I am the door. I am the greater than the temple, the greater than Solomon. Why? Because he came declaring himself as the truth. 
what does the word truth mean in the Greek? It means the the substance that exists as the basis of something. Mm. Meaning all of this stuff had existence because I was the origination of its existence. I'm the reason it existed. That's why it said without him, anything that was made was not made. There would nothing be made without him because he's the origin of it all. And he's the conclusion of it all. So when he come and said, I am the truth, when he come and said, I am the life, he is saying, I am the basis of that to even be a thing. I am the door. I'm the reason that door in Goshen existed. I'm greater than Solomon because I'm the reason there was a Solomon. Ooh. You see how settled before it all was? This should be good news to us when it comes to our salvation. We're not just talking about uh, types and shadows here and fairy tales, right? We're talking about the reality of our salvation is that the very one who lives in us is the conclusion that was concluded before there was something. He was the amen of it before God created anything. And I want you to understand this, and let me take a moment just to address this. Christ and Christ alone fulfills that statement. He is the ex he is the declaration of the Father. He is the exegesis or the full explanation of God. He and he alone fulfills that statement. There's a concept out there that we are also to get what Dijon was saying while Deshaun was saying a while ago. We are there's a teaching that says we are also an individual unique incarnation of the Logos. And so we also can give full, clear explanation of God in our actions, in our deeds, in the manifestation through us. That is not true. That's worse than not true, but I can't say those words. <laughs> yeah. That's awful. <laughs> That's blasphemous. What does that do? Because it makes man the object. Not only that, but it puts an expectation beyond something that was previously eternally concluded. God has never had an expectation beyond the predestined and pre-concluded son of his love. Ever. Ever. He gave a law that had an expectation, but that expectation was based upon the predetermination of God, his son. And I think if we understand the assurance of the secured and established word of God, or we'll get to it in a moment, but the divine speech and language of God that was established before, we will not be swayed will not be detoured and destroyed by those who will, as, we, as what we talked about last time, who will dig pits for us. Remember that? My enemies have dug pits for me. Mm -hmm. And the Septuagint, it was actually tell me fables and lies. They have given me lies. And that's it. We won't be deterred. We won't be swayed and captive to people's lies and fairy tales. That's what the assurance of a predestined, pre-concluded testimony is all about. That we can rest assured in the reality that the law testified of the reality of our salvation, and that is not us but Christ. So when we go back, just a step back in Psalms 119, where he says, well, I'll, I'll save that for a second. Uh, let me read this. This is from a, a commentator by the name of Joseph Benson. 
and uh, he says concerning that the the word of the Lord is fixed or established in heaven forever. He said, God's truth or faithfulness upon which his laws are founded is as fixed as the heaven for they, for they owe their durableness to the same truth. God's truth and faithfulness upon which the law was founded is as fixed as heaven and earth, for they owe their durableness to the same truth. That is why he says, you have created the earth and it abides. It continues. And he says, because they're all your servants. See, what we have to understand is God created the whole thing and everything he created is a servant to one thing. Heaven, earth, things that are in the earth, all of those things are servants for one purpose. And they are servants to that predetermined word. They are all a testimony of that one concluded thing. All of them. So the word of promise, this is a, uh, I want to read this to you. This is from John Gill, I believe, his commentary. The word of promise in the covenant made in heaven is sure to all the seed. Now, he's talking about the word, the law, the testimony made made, uh, in heaven, established in heaven, is sure to all the seed. Every one of the promises is yes and amen in Christ. How How can they say that now? Because it was already yes and amen previously. It was yes and amen eternally in Christ Jesus. Because it was set up and designed by God to where the thing would not exist as a promise unless it first had a yes and amen. See, when we do something, we do it here hoping it will be a conclusion. God does the thing already having a conclusion. That's why he knows the end from the beginning because the conclusion's already in front of him. The conclusion is with him. Wow. Wow. So it is yes and amen in him. It always has been. He just came and declared himself as the yes and amen, showing himself as that. And it's as stable as the heavens and more so because heaven and earth will pass away. The mountains will crumble. But the word of the Lord shall never pass away. The firmness of God's word is seen in him upholding the heavens by the word of his power. And the certainty of the divine promises is illustrated by the perpetuity of the ordinances of heaven. Now, here's, here's where we get into what we talked about in a moment, uh, a moment ago the language that now he'll utilize to talk about his faithfulness to his people, that which his law testified of and his faithfulness to his people, because this is all about the covenant. That's why it was never about seeds as of many, but to thy seed who is Christ, because the air was already settled upon before. The seed was already the air before there was an Israel existing. This is the assurance of the whole thing. God has never looked beyond himself for the fulfillment. He's never looked at you or me to give him anything he expected because his expectation was already fulfilled before he did anything. Jesus in baptism, in the waters of baptism coming up, and him saying, this is my son in whom I am well pleased, was not at that moment true. Yes. It was always true. Yes. He just revealed that Mm -hmm. at that moment. Mm -hmm. That is why I think it's in Mark that it's worded this way. This is my beloved son in whom I have been well pleased. Not at that moment. 
Nothing happened there to make God pleased with him. That was a recognition by heaven itself of the established word that God sent. And saying, this is him. This is the conclusion of everything that I had settled upon before I created anything or anything was made. In fact, without this one, not anything that was made would be made. That moment was the recognition of that. Ooh. But in Jeremiah 31, he uses this terminology. This shall be, this is verse 33, this shall be the covenant I will cut. This is from the literal uh, lit V, which is the um, literal version. This shall be the covenant I will cut with the house of Israel. After those days, declares Jehovah, I will put my law in their inward parts and I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall no longer each man teach his neighbor and each man his brother saying, no Jehovah, for they shall all know me. From the least of them, even to the greatest of them, declares Jehovah, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sins no more. So says Jehovah, who gives, here's the thing, because we're going to talk, this goes into Hebrews when he talks about a new covenant, but look at the assurance he gives to the fulfillment of this, because they're utilizing natural things to try to speak of something that's so far above natural things. I will forgive their iniquity. So says Jehovah who gives the sun for a light by day, the laws of the moon and the stars for a light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. Jehovah of hosts is his name. If these ordinances depart from before me, says Jehovah, the seed of Israel also, shall cease from being a nation before me forever. See that? If the stars, if the seas, if the laws of the moon and the stars and the seas, if those things cease to be and those ordinances are no longer in place, guess what? That means his faithfulness to Israel, his people, will also cease. That's how sure he's, he's saying this is. Now, again, this all comes into, I will make a new covenant. So many people are still waiting on that faithfulness to be made true to these people. It has been in the bringing in of a new covenant. Don't wait for the natural state to be saved. Look for the Israel that is, that is so by heart and not by birth. This is where this is fulfilled, but look at how he shows the assurance of this. If these things cease to be before me, you will cease to be before me because he's saying these things will forever be because I set them in place. And that's what we read a while ago, right? Your faithfulness is to all generations. He's talking about all the generations of the seed or Israel coming to the final generation of Christ himself. Your faithfulness is to all generations. And how does he how does he describe that? Because you've created the earth and it still abides. You've put these things in place and it still is. So says Jehovah, if the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth below can be searched out, I will reject the seed of Israel for all that they have done, declares Jehovah. You see that there is a there is a keeping here because they have done things that would warrant his rejection of them. They have done things that would disqualify them. But what is he saying to them? I have already previously determined my faithfulness to you, and you will not screw that up. Amen. <laughs> I mean, Amen. That's as eloquent as I can say. Is that good? Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> I have already confirmed this thing, mm -hmm. and you are not the one in whom it's confirmed. That's how faithful this is. 
That's how established the word of God, the law, the testimony is, because it is established forever. It is established eternally, and it cannot be abrogated or disrupted by us. So this echoes the sentiment of the psalm, right? Because this is now fulfilled, huh? Okay. Fulfilled as a new covenant coming into the heart. The faithfulness of God being realized in him bringing his law into the heart and writing it in the inward part. The law is the word that was previously established. Now in us as life, as spirit. I hope that makes sense. Um, let me read a couple of more things here. I'm not going to read that. Uh, Yeah, the treasurer of David says, Jehovah's word is not fickle. It is not uncertain. It is and has been settled and determined and sure and immovable eternally. The faithfulness of God's word is declared in the certainty of the eternality or the eternalness of its content, Christ himself. We have observed God's word, his testimony as fickle. That's what we determine. We think God's word is fickle. It's indeterminate. We think it's still open-ended. Right? Because we still think everything's open-ended because I could screw it up one day at a time. Today, what am I going to do to mess things up? What am I going to do to uproot this thing? You can't do that. It's not in your power. Because our salvation, in salvation, we're dealing with something predestined, pre-settled, and established in heaven. That means it's not, nothing of it is established in the earth. It was above. It was something unreachable, meaning untouchable by man. And the reason we can bring it down to such a level of that we do is because we try to see and observe these things without reference to its eternal anchor. But here's the eternal anchor. This is in Proverbs chapter eight, and it speaks of the same reality. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 23. From everlasting I was established. Remember, thy word, O Lord, is established forever. It's settled. The word means established forever in heaven. Here's wisdom speaking, who is Christ himself, speaking as a from a eternal person perspective as the wisdom of God before anything was. And he says from everlasting, I was established from the beginning, from the earliest times of the earth. When there was no depth, I was brought forth. When there was no springs abounding with water before the mountains were settled before the hills, I was brought forth. While he had not yet made the earth and the fields, nor the first dust of the world, when he established the heavens, I was there. Man, that's God. That's so good. When he established the heavens, I was there. When he inscribed a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when the springs of deep became fixed, when he set for the sea its boundaries so that the water could not transgress his command. And when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him as a master workman, and I was daily his delight. See why we said 
at that moment of baptism. He didn't just say that, and, and, and it was true then. He was daily his delight. When? Forever. Before there was anything, before there was anything created. And when everything was created, he was there, and he was the master workman in view of whom and out from whom it all proceeded. Ooh. This is the word of God established forever, and this is the word of God who lives in you. Why would God be foolish enough to look at you and me and say, what do you got for me? What are you going to do? That's why it is by faith through grace or by grace through faith, whichever one it is, I can't remember. That's why it's a work of grace. Because it is the grace of God that has made this one who is before all and is the substance of all to be our life. And some have translated this when he talks about, uh, I was, I was there before him. And this says a master workman. Some would say, I, uh, this is from Adam Clark. He said they many translated. I had, I was a ruler, a governor, a director from eternity. I was the governing object of it all. I directed all of the actions of God. I mean, this is why, again, Jesus come and said, I'm the truth. I'm the essential substance that stood as the basis of everything. I was the eternal construction of it all. And that which our souls possess as the assuring presence of a pre-established, pre-sanctioned salvation is so sure. That substance, that divine object who secures the eternal thought, intention, and purpose concerning which God's word testified is Christ, now present within God's eternally established word and all that is promised, prophesied, is provided to the believing soul as a fulfilling demonstration of God's faithfulness. And not only that, but the fulfilling demonstration of the faithfulness that was described in everything God ever did and said. See, my heart is I want believers to be assured, at least by scriptural proof, that they have within their own hearts the embodiment of something that is eternally settled, that has heavenly predetermination and assurance, and cannot in any way rest upon us for anything, but rest solely upon him and only him. And as we said before, before we started recording, I found that when you say these things to people and you present them a gospel that declares this type of thing, something pre-established and assured, that they'll balk at that. Because you tell them this is so from the moment of regeneration, the moment of new birth. They just say, no, nah, it can't be that. No, it can't be. Why? Because they seek to define and measure salvation and its efficacy, its effectiveness by their own personal experience rather than scriptural substantiation. Well, the scripture says this. Yeah, but I... I the, my experience is, who cares what your experience is? Experience does not and cannot override what a first scripturally presented and secondly, a spiritually present reality does. Experience means nothing. The world loves experience. We want experience. Spirits need it. No, experience does nothing in Christ. 
Not if you're going to define salvation in your experience. Not if you're going to define the sufficiency of your standing with God by your experience, because your experience doesn't matter. Why? Because what you have was predetermined before you ever had an experience. Oh, didn't matter. So the law was spiritual. That's why. Because the law had one goal, one end, and it was spirit. The spirit of life. And God had a governing and a governing singularity in view, a singleness in view. And God did not design the law to allow man's good deeds, quote unquote his works, his religious observances to fulfill its demands. Because all that he did had no effect. Why? Because it was predetermined. Mm -hmm. Its end was established before it began. So man was just flapping away. So in that, God did not allow man's works to fulfill its demands. We see God's faithfulness in it. In the fact that it was eternally established in its conclusion before it started. And that that reality is not something affected by us or Acquired by us, it must be received, imputed to the soul. For that soul to have this heavenly stability. The dis- oh, man. So, let me read this. I wrote this earlier today, the stability and divine fortification of the faithfulness of the law rests upon the assurance of its eternal and heavenly establishment. What does this mean for us? It means that the word of God did not have, does not have, and shall never have any reference point or expectancy in the earth or in the temporary nature of earthly men or earthly things. There's a couple of other things that we could talk about. When he says, I have, well, this is in other places, but we'll get to those verses later in other lessons. Let me, let me stop with, with this. In Hebrews chapter 1, as we did in the previous time, remember we we talked about how the Septuagint read as far as they have dug pits for me, and we said that it says that basically they came to me with lying tales and fables. I looked at the Septuagint again, and I looked at the word or the term word when it talks about the word being established to see what the Greek word that was used would be. Now, I would have thought that it would have been Logos, which speaks of, you know, Christ in the beginning was the word. But actually, it's it's not. So this is going to be important when we read this verse. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. In many parts and in different ways, God in former times, having spoken to the fathers by means of the prophets, in the end of these days, spoke to us in one who is by nature his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, Here's the, and listen to this. This is, takes you back to what we've read in Psalms 119 and John 1. And through whom also he constituted the ages. 
What does that mean? Because the, the King James will say he made the worlds. And people will say, well, that means he created the earth. No, it doesn't. If you go to Hebrews 11, the very beginning of that, you'll see it says, by faith we understand that the things, uh, that the worlds were created. Now, let me read it. I'm going to mess it up. Uh, read it real quick here. Through faith, this is 11, verse 3, Hebrews. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. Listen to that. So that things which are seen were not made of things that are seen or do appear. Well, where did those things that are seen come from? An eternal spiritual source mm -hmm. what without him not anything was made that was made now these things were framed by who the word of god remember he has in these last days spoken to us in his son through whom he constituted caused to exist the ages now though in the hebrews 11 what we just read when he says the worlds were framed it's the word age does it mean the planet it means the age the age of testimony because that's what he's doing in hebrews 11 is bringing them from an age of testimony to the age of fulfillment so he constituted the ages of testimony through this one and at the end of those days, at that the end of that age, he has concluded it all and spoke one final word. And that is his son. The ages are constituted by that one. God utilized and spoke in many different ways to the prophets or through the prophets to the fathers. But he has spoken to us in his son. Now, when I looked at the Septuagint and to find the Greek word for your word is established forever, it's the word that is used here for spoken. He has spoken to us in his son. There's God's final speech. There's God's final utterance. Everything God said, every utterance God had, and we've talked about this before. I know you guys have heard me say it, but there was a there's a word called mystery, the word mystery in the in the New Testament. The word mystery in the Greek, the the root of it is the word muo, which actually means to speak in a muted way and to speak but have your mouth covered with your hand. So when it talks about the age of testimony and these things were a mystery, it's talking about God having spoken in these ways, did it like this. Oh. But, now, but now he's but now. done this. Those days came to their end when God took his hand from his mouth and said, Amen. this is my son in whom. I have been delighting forever. In fact, who was daily my delight, even before one thing was done. Mm -hmm. And who was the master workman who did it all. That's what we're seeing. That's the one who was established. This speech of God, the language of God in its finality is this one. But this one was the one also established forever. It comes as the conclusion that was already concluded before anything was. And he comes as the constitution of an age of testimony. He comes as the fulfillment of the age he constituted as a testimony. And he being the out, and I'm going to read the rest of these verses because there's something here too, who being the outraying or the effulgence of his glory and the exact reproduction of his essence 
sustaining, guiding, propelling all things by the word of his power, have made purific- having made purification of sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become by so much by so much superior to the angels, as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. For to whom of the angels did he say, Son of mine you are, I have begotten you this day. And again, I will be to him a father, and he will be to me a son. And you, that points right back to Solomon, too, but we won't get into that. But here's the one speaking. It's not just the word as a thing. It is the whole speech of God, the full utterance. The word, the word here in Hebrews 1 and the word used in the Septuagint is 2980 in the Strong's, Leleo, which means to speak and declare in order to fully disclose one's mind and intention. That's what was established before. The full exposition of God's thought, his mind, and it struck me because, again, I would just, and, and, you know, not to make too big of a difference because they're all really the same root, but there's different nuances and variations to the word. Uh, when he says in the psalm, your speaking, your full disclosure and declaration has already been established before in heaven. And then Jesus, in, in, in the Hebrew letter, says he's spoken this in his son. You have to see what we've been saying already in this psalm is that it was a prayer and a presentation concerning a soul that is looking forward to the time in which the words that were written in the testimony mm-hmm, mm-hmm. would finally come into his heart in spirit and life. And give him the life which would fully consummate God's thought and Mm -hmm. entirely impute the righteousness that God demands. That's why right before this verse 89, we read verse 88, right? That says, quicken me according to your loving kindness, and I will keep the testimonies of your mouth that you speak I will, I will keep the testimonies that you have uttered because I will be living by the life of the full utterance of your heart. Mm-hmm. He's looking forward. He's not talking about that moment. He's talking about a forward-looking prophecy of when the law would be fulfilled in him. Mm-hmm. 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 When those days came to their end, he spoke. In the certainty of a fulfilled and amen word, who is his beloved son. Not only the eternally sure substance that embodies God's thought, but the full disclosure of him as the full communication of his thought. Implemented, not, not just a thought, but now that thought realized, fulfilled, living in us. So, I hope that's made sense, but here's one last place we need to look before we stop. And it's going to take a second. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, who lives and abides forever. Now look at what he look at what he distinguishes between that for all flesh is a grass and all the glory of man is as the flower of grass. The grass withereth and the flower f- falleth away. But the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which by the gospel has been preached unto you. Some would say 
the word he's talking about that we were born again by is the gospel. No, that's not what he just said. It is the gospel that proclaims this word to you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. by whom you have been born again. See, being born again is the moment when the word of God that is established and settled in heaven eternally finally comes and touches my soul unto redemption and salvation and deliverance and liberty. It's when my soul receives the predetermined, settled declaration of God's heart, the amen of his intent, inwardly, perfectly, and effectually. And in so doing, as the psalmist wrote in verse 88, we can now fulfill the words of his mouth. Because the word who is the fulfillment of his intention is our life. So I just, tonight, that's all I wanted to say. I know it said a lot, but I, I, I wanted to get, <clears throat> I really wanted to get across just the assurance of something settled before we come into the picture. That's good news for us. Amen. Amen because it continues to be that way. It never stops. Mm -hmm. It abides that way, settled, anchored, assured forever because it already was. So we'll stop there guys. Thanks for, I told Kim to keep me on track. I think she didn't do that. <laughs> No, no. I blame her. I blame her. No, no, no. She's here. I can blame her. She her face. Yeah. yeah, I'm just going to say one thing, Ray Bond. Um, yeah. and, and, and I really enjoyed what you said. Mm -hmm. uh, Christ is the foundation of all that God, um, what do I want to say, created. He is the uh, centerpiece. He yeah. is the prototype of, of yep. everything. And when I came to understand that the Holy Spirit began to show me, uh, I've always had a centerpiece when I decorated and I've always decorated around that centerpiece per room. Yeah. And nothing came about without that centerpiece. Yeah. So yeah, that was really good. Yeah. And that's, yeah. that's, yeah, that's true. It's kind of like the whole, you know, the way the universe is created. Um, there's a centerpiece, you know. Yes. But, uh, yeah, that's true. And and that's the thing. We lose sight of that. We lose sight of that when we're talking about our salvation. Yeah. We lose sight of that, which is eternally established, because our salvation to us becomes so personally defined like we talked about a while ago mm -hmm. but it can't be if it is that's where we miss, miss uh, thank god it's not yeah oh, thank god, god. Oh, thank god. <laughs> uh, god. yeah yeah so yeah, you know we, when i look at that centerpiece i say you know price is that centerpiece just like it might be a rug for me or yeah. it might be a picture for me or a table centerpiece. Right. I usually decorate around that centerpiece. Yeah. Everything comes together based on that centerpiece. Yeah, it has to it has to match it or whatever. It has to relate to it in some way. Yeah. Absolutely. And it does. And so, it's even greater than that. And you know, mine would so be a is that centerpiece. Part. Is that centerpiece therefore predestined, not us? Does that make sense? No, we're not. And that's the whole thing that, about because yeah. we were always told we yeah. were spe we were special and well, we that's were the, predestined. Yeah, and that's the and whole we, idea of Calvinism and other other ideologies of uh, wow. you know, because it's always about we are predestined. Well, yeah, that terminology is used, but you have to understand what it's talking about. There was a destination previously settled upon and established before us 
so that God predetermined that if he was to know us, relate to us in any way, we would come and be brought into that predetermined place. Yeah. And that, you know, that previously destined uh, place. And that's, that's our predetermination or our predestination. It's not about us in any way. It's about the yes. place we were predestined to be. The centerpiece. Yeah. In, yeah. yeah. Exactly right. In Very there. good. Exactly right. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you.